You know, I lived in or spent significant amounts of time in every state in the Midwest in my entire life. From going to school on Chicago's south side to spending a week on a farm in northern Wisconsin and everything in between. So let me tell you, if you think this scene in any way reflects reality, you probably also think that the Dukes of Hazard was a documentary. I'm afraid I don't play the banjo. I'm just a viewer with an opinion. Before we begin, I have to tell you that I went into Voyager not only with optimism, I was downright pumped. I was really excited about this series, and so were a lot of my friends. We wanted to like Voyager. No, we wanted to love Voyager. We were all gathered in my dorm room for the premiere like this was the best thing to hit television in years. Never has something failed so miserably to live up to expectations. Things I still remember was the exhausted, nay desperate sound of Dave's voice near the end of Janeway's first scene, pleading, Please, just make the voice stop. You might say we set our sights too high. But no, even today when I look back at the pilot, I don't see it being any better than average, even for Voyager. I'll put on episodes of The Next Generation, DS9, the original series, just to enjoy them. But there aren't as many episodes of Voyager I'd do that with. They just didn't make good use of what they had. So the series begins with a little exposition about the Maquis, a group of people fighting Cardassian occupation of an area of the DMZ where they live. This is important to know because the Maquis are not like your typical Starfleet officers, a fact that will be important a good three or four times over the course of the next seven years. So we see the Maquis getting shot by a Cardassian ship, and Chakotay is at the controls. You see him, Torres, and Tuvok here in the cabin. But as we'll discover over the course of the series, in the back they got like 40 more people crammed in there like this was a clown car or something. Not to mention all the crap they just happen to have on hand, like Chakotay's medicine wheel, just in case they get whisked across the galaxy and need to bring all their crap with them. Anyway, because they all live on the frontier, they all dress like they were extras from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. And not the cool ones that get to ride on the nifty post-apocalyptic vehicles, either the ones who get beaten up by those guys. The clothes always look like they were chosen for maximum squalor in an era where replicators are prevalent and look about as comfortable as a burlap sack. But hey, at least they got those earth tones going, huh? That's a sure way to pick up your spirits. So the Maquis try to escape into the Badlands, an area of space that's the galactic equivalent of acid reflux. The Cardassian ship gets damaged and is forced to break off pursuit, but their victory is short-lived. An alien force rips them away and they disappear. Well, someone must investigate this, and that, God help us all, is Voyager. The reason, see, is that her chief of security was on the missing ship, so Janeway thinks the best way to track them down is to bring in a former Maquis terrorist and use him as a guide. So they find Tom Paris at a Federation penal colony in New Zealand, where he's hard at work doing post-production work for Peter Jackson. Now, the sensible thing, considering that Earth and Deep Space Nine are days away from each other, would be to bring Paris to the station where Voyager is and discuss things. But we are introduced to Janeway here in more ways than one. First, we're introduced to Janeway's voice, and I must say, it was a rude awakening. She's got the vocal timbre of the Marlboro Man. We also get a chance to see the patented Janeway walk, which is to clasp both hands behind your back, rather than letting them swing freely like a normal person. This technique can work under certain circumstances, like, say, you're an English bobby strolling down the street, but when you're speed walking cross country, well, you look like a penguin. <coughs> but we haven't really gotten to the crux of the introduction, which is how Janeway approaches a problem. Always choose the answer that will most hamper the mission. Think about this. She's got to spend days traveling to Earth to meet with Paris and discuss the plan. Now, whatever his answer is, it's going to take days to get back to DS9. If she'd simply had them fly him to the station, then whatever his answer is, they could leave immediately. Either he's on a flight back to New Zealand, or he's on board the ship, but they've shaved days off the mission time. But again, that's not the Janeway way. Still, some suggest that Janeway was here conducting other business as well, and I don't know what that could be. Let's see, screw with the replicator systems, check. Install this new computer virus, check. Yeah, this is all perfect. I could disappear for seven years and this shit would still work out. Fortunately, Paris is now able to delve into the backstory of his relationship with Chakotay, because they have a serious hatred for one another that will last, well, for the next hour and a half. However, he does agree to come along as an observer, but the goofy part is, he's given a Starfleet uniform and Janeway has him join her crew. 
But that's why she's Janeway of Borg, assimilating lowlifes into her crew. He meets up with another new member of the Voyager crew, Harry Kim, who's in Quark's bar over on DS9. Savor this, fair viewers, as it's as close as you're going to get to quality programming. Quark tries to swindle the poor dope into buying a box of worthless rocks, and Harry tries getting out of it by acting like he knows he's being played. But what you have to learn about Harry is that he's one of the most gullible people who has ever lived, regularly duped by any and all around him and never really learning from it. So as you can imagine, in the presence of a skilled scoundrel like Quark, he's like a small child trying to hold off a dragon with a shield made of chocolate. And if it weren't for the timely arrival of Tom Paris, Harry would probably have wound up buying every rock Quark had and a certificate giving him ownership of the moon. Well, we can't have that kind of entertainment here, so it's time to leave. So long, Quark. You made our lives brighter just by your presence, and we'll see you over on a more interesting show. Harry and Tom actually board Voyager and check in with the ship's doctor, who shows all kinds of contempt for Tom. Seems that nobody but our poor, gullible Harry likes him. The part that fascinates me, however, is that the doctor is treating a patient, apparently something pretty serious. However, the ship just launched. Maybe it was a sudden onset of appendicitis or something, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was Janeway ordering a crewman to do something monumentally stupid that landed the poor dope there. Well, don't worry, pal. Harry's here now. He'll be your bitch. Speaking of which, we soon see her talking with Mark about her bitch who is having puppies, and of course she has the same kind of absolute authority over him that she does over the rest of the poor schmucks on board, and he agrees to take her pregnant dog in so that she doesn't have to be bothered with it. Besides that, Litter should be showing signs of that compound XM9 right about now, and it'd be good to see if it worked and that they can breathe fire. Her plotting is interrupted when Tom and Harry show up, where Harry learns not to call her Sir. I'm sorry, ma'am. Ma'am is acceptable in a crunch, but I prefer Captain. For now. <laughs> oh, you're still here. Out on the bridge, peons. Things are uncomfortable because of everyone talking about how Tom was thrown out of Starfleet. Tom was based upon Locarno from the first duty, and was in fact played by Robert Duncan McNeil. They don't just use Locarno because, while Locarno caused an accident and tried to cover it up, only to later take responsibility for it, Tom Paris caused an accident and tried to cover it up, only to later take responsibility for it. Well, clearly, these are two very, very different characters, and the fact that using Locarno would have meant paying royalties to the writers of The First Duty every week definitely had nothing to do with it. I'm sure it never even entered their minds. So Captain Crunch leads her crew into the Badlands, where they too encounter an alien force that rips them away across the galaxy. This is pretty catastrophic, as the whole ship is now trashed, and the first officer and helmsman are dead, and worst of all, Janeway's hair is messed up. Oh, the humanity! The chief engineer is dead, so Janeway heads down to engineering to berate the reactor into working properly or something. Meanwhile, Harry and Tom bring people down to sick bay where more disaster welcomes them. Harry dons a giant asbestos oven mitt and a fire extinguisher and takes care of extinguishing the gas fireplace. I, I, I mean, the raging inferno. The doctor is also dead. Oh, things don't look good for Chakotay. So far, everyone who hates Tom Paris is dead. How convenient. So Harry activates the emergency medical hologram. The image quickly gets down to business, showing his lousy bedside manner that makes him so lovable. Picardo steals every scene, and he delivers an amazing performance, even when he's stuck alone in a dark room. During this, drama is supposedly taking place in engineering, as Janeway shouts things that mean nothing to us while we watch them spray props with other props until everyone believes they're going to be all right. Oh, good. This near-drama experience is outdone when members of the crew begin disappearing. Upon arriving out here on the other side of the galaxy, there was a huge space station, which they called an array because space station isn't science fiction -y enough. So it seems that the crew have arrived on the array, which looks like a Hollywood version of rural life, as you no doubt expect. If they wound up in Canada, they'd be surrounded by Mounties and hockey players saying, Hey, Hoser, just remember that when you wonder why everyone on alien planets always have the same culture. This is where they encounter that welcoming bee you saw earlier, and naturally, every single person cannot walk around this place without having their tricorders out <laughs> look at these people hey hey can we get a few more tricorders over here I, I think we missed an atom if you drop these schmucks in the middle of a completely empty desert each one would insist on walking with their damn tricorder out it's like elderly drivers with their left blinker on they are soon waylaid by this community theater production of to kill a mockingbird the old biddy is bringing out plates of this and that before the mob shows up Dear God, if it turned out they were all dead and this is hell, I wouldn't even blink. 
We've got people dancing around in circles like a bunch of idiots while the banjo music plays. Back to the way I used to was. The young woman tries seducing Tom, apparently mistaking him for one of her cousins. Harry and Tom, however, figure out there's something in the barn. Uh, that's the rule of cinema slash television. If there's a barn, there has to be something sinister inside it. The girl completely spazzes and cleans Tom's clock, and then the townspeople all show up armed with pitchforks. Why is uncertain, since they're just beamed in the medical testing chamber rather than forced, but it's there just to have another chance to show rural people acting rural, walking around with their pitchforks and all that. That's what they do all day long, you know. Hey there, can I have a banjo? No? Well, how about a pitchfork? What else am I supposed to be carrying, huh? The Voyager crew finds themselves lying on tables with a thing stabbing him in the diaphragm. Too good for him, I see. Uh, excruciating. Gotta remember this technique for later. All right, where did we leave off? No, 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 it wasn't that painful. Ah, much, much better. With the crashing of waves and the call of seagulls, this is something I can cope with. After three days in the tender mercies of the Banjo Man, they're beamed back, and we discover that Harry Kim is missing. I'm sure that'll be the last time he'll be the victim. As the Maquis power up their ship, we also learn that Torres, their engineer, is also gone. Janeway suggests that Jacote meet with her to discuss how to find their missing crewman, and he agrees, arriving with Tuvok and... Extra Man! Able to stand there and hold a gun like a ruffian without breathing a word! But apparently even his super extra powers were unable to snoop out the fact that Tuvok was an infiltrator and in fact the missing security chief that Janeway was talking about. Let's take a few moments to further the Chicote paris arc, one that will be extremely important in their relationship until the end of the episode, when it's completely forgotten. Get used to that. Anyway, perhaps the crisis and kidnapping should be dealt with, so they plan to return to the array to try to find the missing crewman. Apparently after Janeway finishes rubbing up against Chicote. I would suggest he scanned our computers in order to select a comfortable holographic environment. Boy, did he screw that up royally. Janeway figures they'll need to be armed with the big, big phasers and turns to Tuvok and tells him to give the gun to the one person here who is a convicted prisoner rather than one of her security officers. Because, heck, we all know how useless those guys are anyway. Tuvok actually is going to have the important job of studying the array and discovering how to use it to send them back. Please keep this point in mind. Janeway told Tuvok to find out how to use this thing to send them back. That'll be important later. So armed with the big, big phaser rifles, they head over to the array. He pulls a pitchfork, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the Acampa, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Starfleet way. Well, thank God for small miracles, because most of the people are gone, leaving only the lone banjo player. Janeway gets into a furious argument with the banjo player, and... Okay, I'm sorry, I'll pause while you can all laugh at how stupid this scene is. Well, aren't you contentious for a minor bipedal species? Oh, it is on now. This minor bipedal species doesn't take kindly to being abducted. By the time I'm through with you, I'll be taking your remains out of here in a beaker. He tells them that they don't have what he needs, but that the missing crewman might, and that he's not going to send them back home either. Although it would be nice to see him hit some of them with a banjo. I would. And faster than you can sing, da 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 he sends them back over to Voyager. We then discover that Harry and Torres are in some medical lab suffering from a really gross disease. They seem to have mucus secreting from their skin in some places. Torres goes all nutty, and people in white coats have to restrain her before one of her boobs nearly flops out. Hey, hey, hey this is Voyager, not Enterprise. Save that stuff. Janeway and Chakotay then agree to head to the fifth planet, which is receiving energy bursts from the caretaker's array, but not before a discussion with Tuvok. It seems the planet is a complete desert. This is, of course, due to a complete lack of... Were you thinking I was going to say water? Don't be an idiot. It's a complete lack of nucleogenic particles. That's what makes it rain, don't you know? Why say something obvious when you can say something obtuse? That's the approach we should always take, right? Before taking off, she talks a little about Harry. Yeah. We know, Captain, we know. You kill him out of love. So on their way to the planet where they think Harry and Torres are, Voyager and the Maquis ship come across a debris field. If only they'd have just kept on going, things could have turned out so much better. But alas, they've come across the one person within the field. Neelix, garbage man extraordinaire. Observe this scan from page 19 of the October 8-14, 1994 TV Guide. 
Neelix, played by Ethan Phillips of Benson. This alien from a species Trekkers have never seen before will serve as commentator on the human condition, just like DS9 Zoto. Just like Quark, he's a meddling scavenger predicted to be Voyager's breakout character. So in what amounts to the greatest bad call since the famous Dewey defeats Truman headline, it was predicted that Neelix was going to be the breakout character. Instead, we discover an irritant that actually exceeds Wesley Crusher on the Trek annoyance scale, and nothing over the years would succeed in diminishing the level of infuriation he causes. Neelix makes Jar Jar Binks look like Morgan Freeman. And to compare him to Odo and Quark? Quark is a slimy, greedy crook, sure, but there's still the whisperings of a conscience in there, and a kind of roguish charm in his oily demeanor. Odo is a standoffish, grumpy individual, but it's the result of deep-seated feelings of being a loner and an outsider, who is torn between his desire to belong and his desire to be left alone. Neelix is just a shithead. It's for this reason that pretty much every review will include the stupid Neelix moment. Captain Catherine Janeway of the Federation Starship Voyager. A very impressive title. I have no idea what it means. But I never let my ignorance get in the way of babbling pointlessly. Anyway, Neelix fills them in on what the caretaker has been up to, and figuring that someone familiar with the local territory might be helpful, Janeway tries to get him to come along. Both those points were mistakes, but Janeway eventually offers to give him water if he'll help them find their missing crew members, and he agrees. Beam. We have a technology which can take you instantly from your ship to ours. It's quite harmless. For now. <laughs> He arrives, and from moment one, he's an obvious irritant. Tuvok's Vulcan patience is clearly strained to the limit dealing with him, and I for one don't blame him. Ugh. Let's hope assholishness isn't a communicable disease. Harry and Torres, meanwhile, are still suffering from their gross disease, which the Ocampa have no idea how to cure. So they decide to spend some time providing some more personal backstory before the doctors, or whatever these people are, they don't seem to be very good at doing actual medicine here, Come in with some clothing so they can lead them out into the settlement and, well, look at the inside of this massive zoo that the place is. And for some reason, even though they've been underground for 500 generations, a lot of them like to dress like they're refugees. The Ocampo were placed here by the caretaker long ago, and he now cares for them with such beautiful things as giant TV screens showing pictures of clouds. What a life. No wonder they only live nine years. They die of boredom. Anyway, they may be suffering, but at least they got heaping bowls of Taco Bell meat to get through the day. Mm-mm. They try to explain to Harry and Torres what's going on, but they don't know much of anything, other than that sick people show up and then die. Not a very comforting diagnosis. Meanwhile, back on Voyager, Tuvok goes to fetch Neelix. Those of you with weak hearts may wish to turn away, as what follows is a mixed blessing. On the one hand, I'm sure Neelix was in desperate need of a bath, and anything to clean him up must be an improvement. On the other hand, witnessing Neelix taking a bath just might be too great a price for that, especially for poor Tuvok. Nevertheless, Neelix tells them where they should go and what should be done, promising that this will get their people back. Did I mention he was a shithead? In actuality, he leads them into danger unwarned. The Kazon Ogla. The Kazon Ogla? Who are the Kazon Ogla? Try to dial down the panic if you want to maintain that unflappable leader vibe you were striving for. The Kazon are squatters on the Ocampan surface, taking their resources, and a group that puts the ugh and ugly, let me tell ya. They look like some kind of twisted planet of the Oompa Loompas, or genetically engineered Cabbage Patch Kids. It turns out that Neelix isn't interested in their crewmen at all, just in rescuing his captured girlfriend, Kess. Let me point out once again that he risked their lives by lying to them and leading them against armed enemies just to further his own ends. Did I mention he was a shithead? Still, we must thank you, Neelix, for being the first to show us just how gullible the Voyager crew is. Oh, we all knew that Harry was, but damn, every single one of them fell for this. Water, Jabin! I have water! To replace all that I borrowed! Hey, you know, you have starships, you travel between planets. Even if you're somehow too stupid to make water out of hydrogen and oxygen, why don't you just fly and pick up some water from another planet? Y you you have a starship! Why are you operating on the same level as people who have yaks? Oh, yeah, because the script says so. 
These guys are really impressed by the sudden appearance of gallons and gallons of water and provide some info about the Ocampa, but Neelix is really only interested in getting Kess back. And to demonstrate the kind of skill that will one day have Janeway make him her ambassador, he halts the negotiations by taking the head Kazon hostage and blasts the containers so that they're now losing what was traded to them for the info that was given fair and square. Hmm, I don't like that you lied to me, but I like your approach to diplomacy. Promise them everything and give them nothing. You're hired! Meanwhile, inside the planet, an Ocampa gets in touch with Harry and Torres. She gives them moss to try to help cure their disease, but they insist that the only way they'll live is if they get out of here. She finally tells them that there are ways, breaks in the security fields, and with some digging tools they can probably escape, so they set to work. Meanwhile on Voyager, the doctor treats Kess's wounds while Tuvok criticizes Neelix's deception and extremely foolhardy behavior. If you had told us what you had planned, we might have anticipated your irrational behavior. Irrational? We got out of there, didn't we? Ex yes, Neelix. Your stupid plan got them into this, and your stupid plan got them out. No one's disagreeing with it. The problem they're having is your tendency towards stupid plans. And just because your stupid plans haven't killed anyone yet, doesn't fill them with a whole lot of confidence. So they discuss what to do next. Kess offers to show them the way to the secret Ocampa and Bat Cave. Well, Neelix immediately objects to that because, and I cannot emphasize this point enough, he's a shithead. Well, since they helped her escape, it would be wrong for Kess not to help Janeway and Chakotay search for their missing crew, so she insists on it. Naturally, since this is a highly dangerous situation, the senior officers of both ships will beam down into the settlement. After all, we've lost most of the other senior officers. What harm is there losing the rest? Kess gets into a fierce argument with the Lido Compen guy about what's been going on, about how these people have allowed the caretaker to so coddle them that they're practically pets. One thing I'm sure we can expect from Kess is to always stand up against anyone who tries to boss her around. Harry and Torres are nowhere in sight, as they've attempted to get out through those secret tunnels that everybody knows about. This is despite Harry, who gets winded after all of four stairs. Time to replace that holodeck with a stairmaster, I think. Paris, Neelix, and Kess start heading up after them with a tricorder pulled out because, hey, you can't climb stairs without a tricorder. You might get lost. They find Harry and Torres and get them out while Tuvok explains what he thinks is going on. That the caretaker is dying, and so he's giving the Ocampa a surplus of energy and sealing the conduits to keep the Kazon out. Tim Russ, who played several fine roles on both Next Generation and DS9, delivers a solid Vulcan performance, and this is probably his highlight for the episode. Harry, Kess, and Torres are beamed back to Voyager, but when communication is cut off with the others, Paris and Neelix go back. It turns out that Chakotay is stranded on the stairwell with a broken leg, but Tom is there to try and rescue them. This is in spite of their animosity, because Paris says that if he rescues Chakotay, his life will belong to him. Whole scene hurts, because it takes excessive pains to beat you about the head with the fact that Chakotay is an American Indian, although what tribe is instated, so they can just keep piling all kinds of stereotypes onto him over the years. And you'll see just a few before the case on arc is resolved. Anyway, the point of this is to wrap up the entire Chakotay Paris storyline in a quick, neat, and offensive package. The only way this could possibly get any worse is if Chakotay solved their nucleogenic particle thing when he reached the surface by performing a rain dance while Peter Pan's What Makes a Red Man Red plays in the background. hum mum 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 hum mum 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 once everyone's been beamed back up, they head to the array, but unfortunately the Kazon want the technology and are willing to fight for it. Voyager and the Maquis ship attack it while Janeway and Tuvok beam over to the array so they can try to figure out how to use it to get back home or get the caretaker to do it. He's near death, lamenting that the process he subjected them to wasn't to infect them with the disease, but to see who might be compatible with him for procreation. So yes, once Harry was infected, either way he was going to get screwed. But it didn't work, so to stop the Kazon, he's creating a self-destruct program that will ensure that they can't use the technology against the Ocampa. Outside, a Kazon super ship is causing so much trouble that Chakotay has to ram it with his own ship, disabling it and causing it to crash into the array. The collision has taken out the self-destruct program, so the caretaker dies, transforming into a urinal cake. What follows this is the most commonly discussed issue in the Bad Janeway Decision Archive. Here they stand with the technology to get home. Janeway has an obligation now to get her crew home and also to bring in the Maquis that she's effectively captured. The Prime Directive says that she shouldn't get involved. And as we'll see, Janeway will follow the Prime Directive even when result in the extinction of entire species because you have no idea what the consequences will be. 
And yet, Janeway believes that they are involved enough here that they have no choice. What happens between here and, just to pick one at random, prototype, where even after Voyager has become involved by altering how one of the robots now functions, she still says that they should be allowed to plod towards extinction. And when you compare that to the Ocampa, what's so special about them? They live lives about as rich as your average goldfish. Now, I'm not trying to justify wiping them all out or anything, but it's not like there's some ancient and wondrous culture at stake that's driving Janeway to make this decision. These are the galactic equivalent of kids who never moved out of their parents' basement. So why does Janeway now of all times choose to ignore the Prime Directive? What makes the Ocampa so special? Nothing, because as I'll discuss later, this has nothing to do with the Ocampa. What's more, there's simply no reason for them to get stranded here, though people seem almost desperate to insist otherwise. Some say that since it caused so much damage and killed so many, they wouldn't want to risk it. Well, if that was the case, why were they repeatedly trying to get the caretaker to send them home using his power if they didn't want him to actually do it? And if you say, oh, but that was the caretaker doing it, it's way too dangerous to do it without him. Remember that point about Tuvok from earlier? He was specifically given the task of finding out how to use the array to send them home. So don't tell me they didn't want to risk it when that was what they kept going on about. Another common one is that there was a time factor, and the Kazon had reinforcements on the way. First, they didn't know about the reinforcements until after Janeway made the decision. So unless the argument is that Janeway is psychic, and that's psychic, not psychotic, that wasn't a factor in her thinking at all. And at no point does anyone suggest that time is a problem except during the fight. No one brings up the time factor once the battle's been won. Another is that Janeway believed the Kazon would be too dangerous to leave with the Array, that they could maybe threaten the galaxy if they had those powers. Well, come on, these Oompa Loompas don't look to be the masters of reverse engineering. Their master super-duper warship got taken out by a collision with one little ship. But let's say for the moment that Janeway has this concern. There are still two ways to deal with this. Set up explosives to detonate and destroy the array using a complicated device called a fuse. After all, we've seen it happen later, like the torpedo that took out the Borg probe ship. But let's say for a moment that for some reason or another they can't. Then, then fine. One of the tests to become a commanding officer is accepting that you'll have to order someone to certain death to save the rest of their crew. Even Deanna Troy managed to figure that one out. So have someone stay behind and set the bombs off after you've gone. Hell, do it yourself if you want to make the grand noble gesture. Now, the one thing that all the excuses to justify this fail at is Janeway herself. She gives her reason, and it's not because of the danger, not because there's no time, not because the Kazon are too dangerous, not for any reason other than the Ocampa. Now, the problem is that this is not the most placating of answers. In fact, Chakotay has to physically restrain Torres when it's given. The assertion for years was that Janeway was too dumb to use a fuse, and the counter-argument was, she's not too dumb to use a fuse, she did this for logical reasons. Then why would she not tell them the logical reasons, as opposed to making one up that is less likely to convince them than the truth would? How are you proving she's not dumb by saying she thinks that a dumb lie is better than a reasonable fact? That's the dumbest thing in the world to do, to tell them that you're going to deliberately strand them rather than admitting you have no choice because the situation makes it impossible. The only reasons to say otherwise would be if you were stupid and somehow thought it was a good idea, or evil and decided to use this as a chance just to screw with them. You decide which is more plausible. But as stated, it's because of the Ocampa. So, do we set the bombs off after we go home? Have our cake and eat it too, like Voyager will always insist on doing with dilemmas? No way! If we did that, we couldn't hang around and watch that thing get blowed up! Woo-wee! After this, Janeway makes all the Maquis members of the crew, including Extra Man, played by Dash Rendar of Shadows of the Empire. She also makes Jakote her first officer, and Paris an acting lieutenant. Neelix and Kess ask if they can stay on board too, and, well, why not? We've already got terrorists and a criminal. Why not a lying garbage man and his elf girlfriend? Com badges for everybody! Then she steps out onto the bridge and gives her big, We're going home because I'm a dumbass speech, and the nacelles lift and separate as they head for home. Post-episode follow-up, 
The stupid Neelix moment is him using the Voyager crew to rescue Kess instead of telling them the truth. I can't believe Janeway would ever consider trusting him again after that. Final score for this episode is 4 out of 10. The pilot just doesn't deliver, and time has not made that any better. The main misstep of this episode is the fact that so many things do not develop organically, such as the way the crew seems to suddenly be so taken and committed to being on the side of the Okampa, when in truth these people are like the Eloy from the Time Machine. The book, not the movie. Except they're the ones that are underground. For all Janeway's talk about children needing to grow up, she seems committed to preserving their status quo. Another big one is obviously the decision to leave, which I've said enough about as far as the illogic of it goes, but looking at it purely from the structural point of view, it's easy to see what they wanted. Janeway is supposed to be presented here as a strong leader who is making a hard choice for moral reasons. And that on paper sounds fine. Make us understand that Janeway is firmly in control here, and also that she's the kind of person who will stand up for her beliefs no matter what the threat might be. But the way it's executed completely undermines that, because what she's doing has an obvious flaw to it. There's no reason they can't get home and destroy the array of both, not without, and this is key, making Janeway choose to stay because she has to, and not because she chooses to, which would be counter to their goal. This decision then backfires. Instead of seeing the captain as she was intended by the writers, the audience sees her as someone who stranded these people because she missed the obvious, and that every tragedy that's encountered is her fault. The only way to wallpaper over that are the kinds of excuses that shift this back to the has to and not chooses to, which is a sign of failure if those who want to defend her must resort to scenarios that are counter to what the writers were trying to achieve.